Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver Book the First Dedication by John Vancouver Brother of the late George Vancouver To the King Sir, Your Majesty having been graciously pleased to permit my late brother Captain George Vancouver to present to Your Majesty the narrative of his labours during the execution of your commands in the Pacific Ocean. I presume to hope that, since it has pleased the divine providence to withdraw from him, your majesty's service and form the society of his friends before he could avail himself of that condescension, your majesty will, with the same benignity, vouchsafe to accept it from my hands in discharge of the melancholy duty which has devolved upon me by that unfortunate event. I cannot but indulge the hope that the following pages will prove to your majesty that Captain Vancouver was not undeserving the honour of the trust reposed in him, and that he has fulfilled the object of his commission from your majesty with diligence and fidelity. Under the auspices of your majesty, the late indefatigable Captain Cook had already shown that a southern continent did not exist, and had ascertained the important fact of the near approximation of the northern shores of Asia to those of America. To those great discoveries, the exertions of Captain Vancouver will, I trust, be found to have added the complete certainty that, within the limits of his researches, on the continental shores of Northwest America, no internal sea or other navigable communication whatever exists, uniting the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. I have the honour to be, sir, with the most profound respect, your Majesty's most faithful and devoted subject and servant, John Vancouver. Voyage to the North Pacific Ocean and Round the World by Captain George Vancouver. Book the First. Introduction by George Vancouver. In contemplating the rapid progress of improvement in the sciences and the general diffusion of knowledge since the commencement of the 18th century, we are unavoidably led to observe, with admiration, that active spirit of discovery by means of which the remotest regions of the earth have been explored, a friendly communication opened with their inhabitants and various commodities of a most valuable nature, contributing either to relieve their necessities or augment their comforts, introduced among the less enlightened part of our species, a mutual intercourse has also been established in many instances on the solid basis of a reciprocity of benefits and the productive labor of the civilized world has found new markets for the disposal of its manufactures. Nor has the balance of trade been wholly against the people of the newly discovered countries. For whilst some have been enabled to supply their visitors with an abundance of food and the most valuable refreshments in exchange for iron, copper, useful implements and articles of ornament, the industry of others has been stimulated to procure the skins of animals and other articles of a commercial nature, which they have found to be eagerly sought for by the traders who now resort to their shores from Europe, Asia, and the eastern side of North America. The great naval powers of Europe, inspired with a desire not only of acquiring, but also of communicating knowledge, had extended their researches in the 16th and 17th centuries as far into the Pacific Ocean as their limited information of the geography of the earth at that time enabled them to penetrate. Some few attempts had also been made by this country towards the conclusion of each of those centuries, but it was not until the year 1704 that Great Britain, benefiting from the experience of former enterprises, laid the foundation for that vast accession of geographical knowledge which she has since obtained by the persevering spirit of her successive distinguished circumnavigators. By the introduction of nautical astronomy into marine education, we are taught to sail on the hypotenuse instead of traversing two sides of a triangle, which was the usage in earlier times. By this means, the circuitous course of all voyages from place to place is considerably shortened. And it has now become evident that few officers of the most common rate abilities who will take the trouble of making themselves acquainted with the principles of this science, will, on all suitable occasions, with proper and correct in struments, be enabled to acquire a knowledge of their situation in the Atlantic, Indian, or Pacific Oceans. 
with a degree of accuracy sufficient to steer on a meridional or diagonal line to any known spot, provided it be sufficiently conspicuous to be visible at any distance from five to ten leagues. This great improvement, by which the most remote parts of the terrestrial globe are brought so easily within our reach, would nevertheless have been comparatively of little utility had not those happy means been discovered for preserving the lives and health of the officers and seamen engaged in such distant and perilous undertakings, kings, which were so successfully practiced by Captain Cook, the first great discoverer of this salutary system in all his latter voyages round the globe. But in none have the effects of his wise regulations, regimen and discipline been more manifest than in the course of the expedition of which the following pages are designed to treat. To an unremitting attention, not only to food, cleanliness, ventilation, and an early administration of antiseptic provisions and medicines, but also to prevent, as much as possible, the chance of indisposition by prohibiting individuals from carelessly exposing themselves to the influence of climate or unhealthy indulgences in times of relaxation, and by relieving them from fatigue and the inclemency of the weather, the moment the nature of their duty would permit them to retire is to be ascribed the preservation of the health and lives of seafaring people on long voyages, instead of vessels returning from parts by no means very remote, with the loss of one half and sometimes two thirds of their crews in consequence of scorbutic and other contagious disorders. Instances are now not wanting of laborious services having been performed in the most distant regions in which, after an absence of more than three or four years, during which time the vessels had been subjected to all the vicissitudes of climate, from the scorching heat of the torrid zone to the freezing blasts of the Arctic or Antarctic circles. The crews have returned in perfect health and consisting nearly of every individual they had carried out, whilst those who unfortunately had not survived either from accident or disease, did not exceed in number the mortality that might reasonably have been expected during the same period of time in the most healthy situations of this country. To the valuable improvements Great Britain is, at this time, in a great measure indebted for her present exalted situation amongst the nations of the earth, and it should seem that the reign of George III had been reserved by the great disposer of all things for the glorious task of establishing the grand keystone to that expansive arch, over which the arts and sciences should pass to the furthest corners of the earth, for the instruction and happiness of the most lowly children of nature. Advantages so highly beneficial to the untutored parts of the human race, and so extremely important to that large proportion of the subjects of this empire who are brought up to these services, deserve to be justly appreciated and it becomes of very little importance to the bulk of society, whose enlightened humanity teaches them to entertain a lively regard for the welfare and interest of those who engage in such adventurous undertakings for the advancement of science or for the extension of commerce, what may be the uninformed opinions or sarcasms of those few unenlightened minds that may peevishly demand what beneficial consequences, if any, have followed or are likely to follow to the discoverers or to the discovered, to the common interests of humanity, or to the increase of useful knowledge, from all our boasted attempts to explore the distant recesses of the globe. The learned editor, who has so justly anticipated this injudicious remark, has, in his very comprehensive introduction to Captain Cook's last voyage, from whence the above quotation is cited, given to the public, not only a complete an answer to that question, but has treated every other part of the subject of discovery so ably as to render my further observations on former voyages of this description totally unnecessary for the purpose of bringing the reader acquainted with what had been accomplished previously to my being honored with His Majesty's commands to follow up the labors of the illustrious navigator, Captain James Cook, to whose ready, uniform, and indefatigable attention to the several objects on which the success of his enterprises ultimately depended, the world is indebted for such eminent and important benefits. Those benefits did not long remain unnoticed by the commercial part of the British nation. Remote and distant voyages being now no longer objects of terror, 
enterprises were projected and carried into execution for the purpose of establishing new and lucrative branches of commerce between Northwest America and China. Parts of the coast of the former that had not been minutely examined by Captain Cook became now the general resort of the persons thus engaged. Unprovided as these adventurers were with proper astronomical and nautical instruments, and having their views directed almost entirely to the object of their employment, they had neither the means nor the leisure that were indispensably requisite for amassing any certain geographical information. This became evident from the accounts of their several voyages given to the public, in which notwithstanding that they positively contradicted each other, as well in geographical and nautical details as in those of a commercial nature, they yet agreed in filling up the blanks in the charts of Captain Cook with extensive islands and a coast apparently much broken by innumerable inlets, which they had left almost entirely unexplored. The charts accompanying the accounts of their voyages representing the northwest coast of America to be so much broken by the waters of the Pacific Ocean gave encouragement once more to hypotheses. And the favorite opinion that had slept since the publication of Captain Cook's voyage of a northeastern communication between the waters of the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans was signified from its state of slumber and brought forward with renovated vigor. Once more the archipelago of St. Lazarus was called forth into being and its existence assumed upon the authority of a Spanish admiral named De Fonte, De Fonta or De Fuentes and of a Mr. Nicholas Shapley from Boston in America who was stated to have penetrated through this archipelago by sailing through a Mediterranean sea on the coast of Northwest America within a few leagues of the oceanic shores of that archipelago where he is said to have met the admiral the straits, said to have been navigated by Juan de Fuca, were also brought forward in support of this opinion. And, although the existence or extent of these discoveries remained still to be proved by an authenticated survey of the countries which had been thus cited to have been seen and passed through, yet the enthusiasm of modern clear philosophy, eager to revenge itself for the refutation of its former fallacious speculations, ventured to accuse Captain Cook of hastily exploring its systems and ranking him amongst the pursuers of paltry, dared even to drag him forward in support of its visionary conjectures. With what reason, or with what justice, such animadversions have been cast upon one who, unhappily for the world, does not survive to enforce his own judicious opinions founded as they were on the solid principles of experience and of ocular demonstration, uninfluenced by any prejudice and unbiased by any preconceived theory, or hypothesis. It is not my province to decide. Let it suffice to say that the labors of that distinguished character will remain a monument of his preeminent abilities and dispassionate investigation of the truth as long as science shall be respected in the civilized world or as long as succeeding travelers who shall unite in bearing testimony to the profundity of his judgment shall continue to obtain credit with the public. Although the ardor of the present age to discover and delineate the true geography of the earth had been rewarded with uncommon and unexpected success, particularly by the persevering exertions of this great man, yet all was not completed. And though subsequent to his last visit to the coast of Northwest America, no expedition had been projected by government for the purpose of a more exact knowledge of that extensive and interesting country. Yet a voyage was planned by his planning some of the southern regions. And in the autumn of the year 1789, directions were given for carrying it into effect. Captain Henry Roberts, of known and tried abilities, who had served under Captain Cook during his two last voyages, and whose attention to the scientific part of his profession had afforded that great navigator frequent opportunities of naming him with much respect, was called upon to take charge of and to command the proposed expedition. At that period, I had just returned from a station at Jamaica under the command of Commodore, now Vice Admiral, Sir Alan Gardner, who mentioned me to Lord Chatham and the Board of Admiralty, and I was solicited to accompany Captain Roberts as his second. In this proposal, I acquiesced and found myself very pleasantly situated in being thus connected with a fellow traveler for whose abilities I bore the greatest respect 
and in whose friendship and good opinion I was proud to possess a place. And as we had sailed together with Captain Cook on his voyage towards the South Pole, and as both had afterward accompanied him with Captain Clark in the discovery during his last voyage, I had no doubt that we were engaged in an expedition which would prove no less interesting to my friend than agreeable to my wishes. A ship, proper for the service under contemplation, was ordered to be provided. In the yard of Messrs. Randall and Brent, on the banks of the Thames, a vessel of 340 tons burden was nearly finished, and as she would require but few alterations to make her in every respect fit for the purpose, she was purchased, and on her being launched, was named the Discovery. The first day of the year, 1790, the discovery was commissioned by Captain Roberts. Some of the other officers were also appointed, and the ship was conducted to His Majesty's dockyard at Deptford, where it was put into a state of equipment, which was ordered to be executed with all the dispatch that the nature of the service required. For some time previous to this period, the Spaniards, roused by the successful efforts of the British nation to obtain a more extended knowledge of the earth, had not only ventured to visit some of the newly discovered islands in the tropical regions of the Pacific Ocean, but had also, in the year 1775, with a spirit somewhat analogous to that which prompted their first discovery of America, extended their researches to the northward, along the coast of northwest America. But this undertaking did not seem to have reached beyond the acquisition of a very superficial knowledge of the shores, and though these were found to be extremely broken and divided by the waters of the Pacific, yet it does not appear that any measures were pursued by them for ascertaining the extent to which those waters penetrated into the interior of the American continent. This apparent indifference in exploring new countries ought not, however, to be attributed to a deficiency in skill or to a want of spirit for enterprise in the commanders of that expedition, because there is great reason to believe that the extreme caution which has so long and so rigidly governed the court of Madrid, to prevent as much as possible, not only their American, but likewise their Indian establishments, from being visited by any Europeans, unless they were subjects of the crown of Spain and liable to a military tribunal, had greatly conspired with other considerations of a political nature to repress that desire of adding to the fund of geographical knowledge which has so eminently distinguished this country. And hence, it is not extraordinary that the discovery of a northwestern navigable communication between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans should not have been considered as an object much to be desired by the Spanish court. Since that expedition, however, the Spaniards seem to have considered their former national character as in some measure at stake and they have certainly become more acquainted than they were with the extensive countries immediately adjoining to their immense empire in the New World. Yet the measures that they adopted in order to obtain that information were executed in so defective a manner that all the important questions to geography still remained undecided and in the same state of uncertainty. Towards the end of April, the discovery was, in most respects, in a condition to proceed down the river when intelligence was received that the Spaniards had committed depredations on different branches of the British commerce on the coast of Northwest America, and that they had seized on the English vessels and factories in Nootka Sound. This intelligence gave rise to disputes between the courts of London and Madrid, which wore the threatening appearance of being terminated by no other means than those of reprisal. In consequence of this, an armament took place, and the further Pacific equipment of the discovery was suspended. Her stores and provisions were returned to the respective offices, and her officers and men were engaged in more active service. On this occasion, I resumed my profession under my highly esteemed friend, Sir Alan Gardner, then captain of the Courageux, where I remained until the 17th of November following when I was ordered to town for the purpose of attending to the commands of the Board of Admiralty. The uncommon celerity and unparalleled dispatch which attended the equipment of one of the noblest fleets that Great Britain ever saw had probably its due influence upon the court of Madrid, for, in the Spanish Convention, 
which was consequent on that armament. Restitution was offered to this country for the captures and aggressions made by the subjects of His Catholic Majesty. Together with an acknowledgement of an equal right with Spain to the exercise and prosecution of all commercial undertakings in those seas, reputed before to belong only to the Spanish crown. The extensive branches of the fisheries and the fur trade to China being considered as objects of very material importance to this country, it was deemed expedient that an officer should be sent to Nootka to receive back in form a restitution of the territories on which the Spaniards had seized and also to make an accurate survey of the coast from the 80th degree of north latitude northwestward toward Cook's River and further to obtain every possible information that could be collected respecting the natural and political state of that country. The outline of this intended expedition was communicated to me and I had the honor of being appointed to the command of it. At this juncture it appeared to be of importance that all possible exertion should be made in its equipment and as the discovery which had been selected on the former occasion was now rigged some of her stores provided and she herself considered in most respects as a vessel well calculated for the voyage under contemplation she was accordingly directed to be got ready for that service and the Chatham Arm tender of 135 tons burden built at Dover having been destined to accompany the discovery on the former occasion, was ordered to be equipped to attend on the voyage now to be undertaken, and was sent to Woolwich to receive such necessary repairs and alterations as were deemed requisite. The discovery was copper fastened, sheathed with plank and coppered over, the Chatham only sheathed with copper. The former mounted ten four-pounders and ten swivels. The latter four three-pounders and six swivels. The following list will exhibit the establishment of the officers and men in the two vessels. An account of the number of officers and men on board the Discovery Sloop of War in December 1790. Officers, Captain George Vancouver, Lieutenant Zachariah Mudge, Peter Puget, Joseph Baker and Joseph Whitby. One master, one boastwain, one carpenter, one gunner, one surgeon, six midshipmen, three master mates, three boatswain's mates, three carpenter's mates, two gunner's mates, two surgeon's mates, four carpenter's crew, one master at arms, one corporal, one sailmaker, one sailmaker's mates, one armorer, one cook, one cook's mate, one clerk, six quartermasters, 28 able seamen of the marines, one sergeant, one corporal, and 14 privates, total, 100. An account of the number of officers and men on board the Chatham Arm Tender in December 1790. Commander Lieutenant W. R. Broughton, Lieutenant James Hansen, Master James Johnstone, one boatswain, one carpenter, one gunner, one surgeon, four midshipmen, two master's mates, two boatswain's mates, two carpenter's mates, two gunner's mates, one surgeon's mate, one sailmaker, one armorer, one clock, four quartermasters, ten able seamen of the marines, one sergeant and seven privates. Total, 45. I had great reason to be satisfied with these arrangements. The second and third lieutenants and the master of the discovery, whom I had the honor of being allowed to name for this service, had all served some years with me under the command of Sir Alan Gardner, both at home and in the West Indies. The other officers were men of known character possessing good abilities and excellent dispositions which their subsequent conduct and zeal exhibited on all occasions sufficiently demonstrated. In the former equipment of the discovery Captain Roberts and myself had undertaken to make all such astronomical and nautical observations as the circumstances occurring in the voyage might demand. This now devolved upon me alone but with the assistance of Mr. Whitbay I entertained little doubt of accomplishing the proposed object, at least in a useful manner, for which purpose we were supplied by the Navy Board with such an assortment of instruments as I considered to be necessary. It was with infinite satisfaction that I saw, amongst the officers and young gentlemen of the quarter-deck, some who, with little instruction, would soon be enabled to construct charts, take plans of bays and harbors, 
draw landscapes, and make faithful representations of the several headlands, coasts, and countries which we might discover. Thus, by the united efforts of our little community, the whole of our proceedings, and the information we might obtain in the course of the voyage, would be rendered profitable to those who might succeed us in traversing the remote parts of the globe that we were destined to explore without the assistance of professional persons as astronomers or draftsmen. Botani, however, was an object of scientific inquiry with which no one of us was much acquainted. But as, in expeditions of a similar nature, the most valuable opportunities had been afforded for adding to the general stock of botanical information, Mr. Archibald Menzies, a surgeon in the Royal Navy, who had before visited the Pacific Ocean in one of the vessels employed in the fur trade, was appointed for the specific purpose of making such researches, and had, doubtless, given sufficient proof of his abilities to qualify him for the station it was intended he should fill. For the purpose of preserving such new or uncommon plants, as he might deem worthy of a place amongst His Majesty's very valuable collection of exotics at Kew, a glazed frame was erected on the after part of the quarter deck for the reception of those he might have an opportunity of collecting. The Board of Admiralty, greatly attentive to our personal comforts, gave directions that the Discovery and Chatham should each be supplied with all such articles as might be considered in any way likely to become necessary during the execution of the long and arduous service in which we were about to engage. Our stores from the naval arsenals were ordered to be selected of the very best sorts and to be made with materials of the best quality. In addition to the ordinary establishment, we were supplied with a large assortment of lines and other useful fishing tackle of various kinds. The provisions were furnished at the victualling office with the greatest care, all of which proved to be excellent and manifested the judgment which had been exercised in the selection and preparation of the several articles. To these were added a large proportion of four lentil, portable soup, wheat instead of the usual supply of oatmeal for breakfast, the essence of malt and spruce, malt, hops, dried yeast, flour and fried mustard, which may all be considered as articles of food, those of a medicinal nature with which we were amply supplied were Dr. James's powders, vitriolic elixir, the rob of lemons and oranges in such quantities and proportions as the surgeon thought requisite, together with an augmentation to the usual allowance amounting to a hundred weight of the best Peruvian bark. To render our visits as acceptable as possible to the inhabitants of the islands or continent in the Pacific Ocean, and to establish on a firm basis a friendly intercourse with the several tribes with which we might occasionally meet, Lord Grenville directed that a liberal assortment of various European commodities, both of a useful and ornamental nature, should be sent on board from the Secretary of State's office. From the Board of Ordnance, the vessels were supplied with everything necessary for our defence, and among other articles were four well-contrived three-pound field pieces for the protection of our little encampment against any hostile attempts of the native Indians, among whom we should necessarily have frequent occasion to reside on shore, and for the amusement and entertainment of those who were peaceably and friendly disposed towards us. We were furnished with a most excellent assortment of well-prepared fireworks, so that nothing seemed to have been forgotten or omitted that might render our equipment as complete as the nature of the service we were about to execute could be considered to demand. But as I have hitherto only pointed out in general terms the outline of the intended expedition, the various objects it proposed to embrace and the end it was expected to answer will be more clearly perceived by the perusal of the instructions under which I was to sail and by which I was to govern my conduct. And the reader will be thereby enabled to form a judgment how far His Majesty's commands during this voyage have been properly carried into execution. By the commissioners for executing the office of Lord High Admiral of Great Britain and Ireland, etc. The King having judged it expedient that an expedition should be immediately undertaken for acquiring a more complete knowledge than has yet been obtained of the northwest coast of America and the sloop you command, together with the Chatham armed tender, the lieutenant commanding, 
which has been directed to follow your orders, having been equipped for that service, you are, in pursuance of His Majesty's pleasure, signified to us by Lord Grenville, one of his principal secretaries of state, hereby required and directed to proceed without loss of time with the said ship and tender to the Sandwich Islands in the North Pacific Ocean, where you are to remain during the next winter, employing yourself very diligently in the examination and survey of the said islands, and, as soon as the weather shall be favorable, which may be expected to be in February, or at latest in March 1792, you are to repair to the northwest coast of America for the purpose of acquiring a more complete knowledge of it, as above mentioned. It having been agreed by the late convention between His Majesty and the Catholic King, a printed copy of which you will receive herewith, that the buildings and tracts of land situated on the northwest coast above mentioned or on islands adjacent thereto, of which the subjects of His Britannic Majesty were disposed about the month of April 1789, by a Spanish officer shall be restored to the said British subjects. The Court of Spain has agreed to send orders for that purpose to its officers in that part of the world. But as the particular specification of the parts to be restored may still require some further time, it is intended that the King's orders for this purpose shall be sent out to the Sandwich Islands by a vessel to be employed to carry thither a further store of provisions for the sloop and armed tender above mentioned, which it is meant shall sail from this country in time to reach those islands in the course of next winter. If, therefore, in consequence of the arrangement to be made with the court of Spain, it should hereafter be determined that you should proceed, in the first instance, to Nootka or elsewhere, in order to receive from the Spanish officers such lands or buildings as are to be restored to the British subjects. Orders to that effect will be sent out by the vessel above mentioned. But if no such orders should be received by you previous to the end of January 1792, you are not to wait for them at the Sandwich Islands, but to proceed in such course as you may judge most expedient for the examination of the coast above mentioned, comprised between latitude 60 the ground north and 30 the ground north in which examination the principal objects which you are to keep in view are first, the acquiring accurate information with respect to the nature and extent of any water communication which may tend, in any considerable degree, to facilitate an intercourse for the purposes of commerce between the northwest coast and the country upon the opposite side of the continent which are inhabited or occupied by His Majesty's subjects. Secondly, the ascertaining, with as much precision as possible, the number, extent, and situation of any settlements which have been made within the limits above mentioned by any European nation and the time when such settlement was first made. With respect to the first object, it would be of great importance if it should be found that, by means of any considerable inlets of the sea, or even of large rivers communicating with the lake, such an intercourse as has been already mentioned, could be established. It will therefore be necessary for the purpose of ascertaining this point that the survey should be so conducted as not only to ascertain the general line of the sea coast, but also the direction and extent of all such considerable inlets, whether made by arms of the sea or by the mouths of large rivers, as may be likely to lead to or facilitate such communication as is above described this being the principal object of the examination. So far as relates to that part of the subject, it necessarily follows that a considerable degree of discretion must be left, and is therefore left to you as to the means of executing the service which His Majesty has in view. But, as far as any general instructions can here be given on the subject, it seems desirable that, in order to avoid any unnecessary loss of time, you should not and are therefore hereby required and directed not to pursue any inlet or river further than it shall appear to be navigable by vessels of such burden as might safely navigate the Pacific Ocean. But, as the navigation of such inlets or rivers, to the extent here stated, may possibly require that you should proceed up them further than it might be safe for the sloop you command to go, you are, in such case, 
to take the command of the armed tender in person at all such times and in such situations as you shall judge it necessary and expedient. The particular course of the survey must depend on the different circumstances which may arise in the execution of a service of this nature. It is, however, proper that you should, and you are therefore hereby required and directed to pay a particular attention to the examination of the supposed strait of Juan de Fuca, said to be situated between 48 Oleg and 49 Dig North latitude, and to lead to an opening through which the sloop Washington is reported to have passed in 1739, and to have come out again to the northward of Nootka. The discovery of a near communication between the ocean and any river running into or from the lake of the woods would be particularly useful. If you should fail to discover any such inlet, as is above mentioned, to the southward of Cook's River, there is the greatest probability that it will be found that the Enid River rises in some of the lakes already known to the Canadian traders and to the servants of the Hudson's Bay Company, which point it would, in that case, be material to ascertain. And you are, therefore, to be cautious to ascertain accordingly, with as much precision as the circumstances existing at the time may allow. But the discovery of any similar communication more to the southward, should any such exist, would be much more advantageous for the purposes of commerce, and should therefore be preferably attended to, and you are, therefore, to give it a preferable attention accordingly. With respect to the second object above mentioned, it is probable that more particular instructions will be given to you by the vessel to be sent to the Sandwich Islands as aforesaid. But if not, you are to be particularly careful in the execution of that and every other part of the service with which you are entrusted to avoid, with the utmost caution, giving any ground of jealousy or complaint to the subjects of His Catholic Majesty. And if you should fall in with any Spanish ships employed on any service similar to that which is hereby committed to you. You are to afford to the officer commanding such ships every possible degree of assistance and information, and to offer to him that you and he should make to each other, reciprocally, a free and unreserved communication of all plans and charts of discoveries made by you and him in your respective voyages. If, in the course of any part of this service, you or the officers or the people under your command should meet with the subjects or vessels of any other power or state. You and they are to treat them in the most friendly manner and to be careful not to do anything that may give occasion to my interruption of that peace which now happily subsists between His Majesty and all other powers. The whole of the survey above mentioned if carried on with a view to the objects before stated without too minute and particular an examination of the detail of the different parts of the coast laid down by it, may, as it is understood, probably be completed in the summers of 1792 and 1793, and in the intermediate winter it will be proper for you to repair, and you are hereby required and directed to repair accordingly to the Sandwich Islands, and during your stay there you are to endeavour to complete any part which may be unfinished of your examination of those islands. After the conclusion of your survey in the summer of 1793, you are, if the state and circumstances of the ship and tender under your command will admit of it, to return to England by Cape Horn, for which the season will then probably be favourable, repairing to Spithead, where you are to remain until you receive further order and sending to our secretary an account of your arrival and proceedings. It seems doubtful at present how far the time may admit of your making any particular examination of the western coast of South America. But, if it should be practicable, you are to begin such examination from the south point of the island of Chilo, which is in about 44 degrees south latitude. And you are, in that case, to direct your attention to ascertaining what is the most south and Spanish settlement on that coast and what harbours there are south of that settlement. In the execution of every part of this service, it is very important that you should use, and you are therefore hereby firmly charged to use every possible care to avoid disputes with the natives of any of the parts where you may touch and to be particularly attentive to endeavour 
by a judicious distribution of the presents which have been put on board the sloop and tender under your command by order of Lord Grenville and by all other means to conciliate their friendship and confidence given under our hands the 8th of March 1791 Chatham, R.D. Hopkins, Hood, J.T. Townsend to George Vancouver, Esquire commander of His Majesty's sloop the Discovery at Falmouth by command of their lordships Perch H. Stevens additional instructions by the commissioners for executing the office of Lord High Admiral of Great Britain and Ireland etc. Lieutenant Hergest commanding the Daedalus transport by whom you will receive this being directed to put himself under your command and to follow your orders for his further proceedings you are hereby required and directed to take him and the said transport under your command accordingly receiving from her the provisions and stores intended for the use of the loop you command and the Chatham armored tender or such part thereof as the side ship and tender shall be able to stow and whereas you will receive here with a duplicate of a letter from Count Florida Blanca to the Spanish officer commanding at Nootka together with a translation thereof signifying his Catholic Majesty's orders to cause such officer as may be appointed on the part of his Britannic Majesty to be put in possession of islands therein described which were occupied by His Majesty's subjects in the month of April 1780 pursuant to the article of the late convention a copy of which has been sent to you and to deliver up any persons in the service of British subjects who may have been detained in those parts in case therefore you shall receive this at Nootka you are to deliver to the Spanish officer commanding at that port the above mentioned letter from Count Florida Blanca and to receive from him conformably thereto on the part of his Britannic Majesty possession of the buildings and districts and parcels of land of which his Majesty's subjects were possessed at the above mentioned period in case however this shall not find you at Nootka when Lieutenant Hergest arrives there but be delivered to you at the Sandwich Islands or elsewhere and the said lieutenant shall not have then carried into execution the fence above mentioned which in the event of his not falling in with you he is directed to do you are immediately to proceed to Nootka and to carry that service into execution as above directed taking the said lieutenant and transport with you if you shall judge it necessary but as they are intended afterwards to proceed to New South Wales to be employed there under the orders of Commodore Philip you are not to detain them at Nootka, the Sandwich Islands, or elsewhere, longer than may be absolutely necessary, but to direct Lieutenant Hergus to repair with the said transport to Fort Jackson, with such livestock and other refreshments as may be likely to be of use in the settlements there, and to touch at New Zealand in his way, from whence he is to use his best endeavours to take with him one or two flax dressers, in order that the new settlers at Port Jackson may if possible, be properly in the management of that valuable plant. Previous, however, to your dispatching him to Port Jackson, you are to consider whether, in case of your not being able to take on board the whole of the transport's cargo, any future supply of the articles of which it is composed will be necessary to enable you to continue your intended survey. And if so, you are to be careful to send notice thereof to Commodore Philip who will have directions on the receipt of your application to redispatch the transport or to send such other vessel to you with the remainder of those supplies as well as any others he may be able to furnish to such rendezvous as you shall appoint and whereas Mr. Dundas has transmitted to us a sketch of the coast of North America extending from Nootka down to the latitude of 47 degree 30 including the inlet or gulf of Juan de Fuca and as from the declarations which have lately been made there appears to be the strongest disposition on the part of the Spanish court that every assistance and information should be given to his Britannia Majesty's officers employed on that coast with a view to enabling them to carry their orders into execution we send you the fixed sketch herewith for your information and use and do hereby require and direct you to do everything in your power to cultivate a good understanding with officers and subjects of his Catholic Majesty who may fall in your way in order that you may 
reap the good favor of this disposition of the Spanish court. You are to take the utmost care in your power, on no account whatever, to touch at any port on the continent of America, to the southward of the latitude of 30 degree north, nor to the north of that part of South America, where, on your return home, you are directed to commence your intended survey. Unless, from any accident, you shall find it absolutely necessary for your immediate safety to take shelter there, and, in case of such an event, to continue there no longer than your necessities require, in order that any complaint on the part of Spain on this point may, if possible, be prevented. If, during your continuance on the American coast, you should meet with any of the Chinese who were employed by Mr. Mears and his associates, or any of His Majesty's subjects, who may have been in captivity, you are to receive them on board the sloop you command, and to accommodate them in the best manner you may be able, until such time as opportunities may be found of sending them to the different places to which they may be desirous of being conveyed, victualling them during their continuance on board in the same manner as the other persons on board the said sloop are victualled. Given under our hands, the 20th of August, 1791. Chatham, J.T. Townshend, A. Garrett, to George Vancouver, commander of His Majesty's ship, the Discovery. By command of their lordships, Paul Stevens. Letter from Count Plurida Blanca, translated from the Spanish. In conformity to the first article of the Convention of 28th of October, 1790, between our court and that of London, printed copies of which you will have already received, and of which another copy is here enclosed, in case the first have not come to hand, you will give directions that His Britannic Majesty's officer, who will deliver this letter, shall immediately be put in possession of the buildings and districts or parcels of land which were occupied by the subjects of that sovereign in April, 1789, as well in the port of Nootka or of St. Lawrence, as in the other, said to be coloured Port Cox, and to be situated about 16 leagues distant from the former to the southward, and that such parcels or districts of land of which the English subjects were dispossessed be restored to the said officer in case the Spaniards should not have given them up. You will also give orders, unless if any individual in the service of British subjects, whether a Chinese or of any other nation, should have been carried away and detained in those parts, such person shall be immediately delivered up to the above-mentioned officer. Without changing the content, the spelling errors in the text can be fixed as follows. I also communicate all this to the Viceroy of New Spain by His Majesty's command, and by the royal command I charge you with the most punctual and precise execution of this order. May God preserve you many years. Signed, the Count Florida Blanca, Aranjuez, 12th May, 1791, to the Governor or Commander of the Fort at St. Lawrence by the commissioners for executing the office of Lord High Admiral of Great Britain and Ireland, etc. In addition to former orders, you are hereby required and directed by all proper conveyances to send to our secretary for our information, accounts of your proceedings and copies of the surveys and drawings you shall have made. And upon your arrival in England, you are immediately to repair to this office in order to lay before us a full account of your proceedings in the whole course of your voyage, taking care before you leave the ship to demand from the officers and petty officers the log books, journals, drawings, etc. they may have kept, and to seal them up for our inspection, and in joining them, and the whole crew not to divulge where they have been until they shall have permission to do so and you are to direct the lieutenant commanding the Chatham Arm Tender to do the same with respect to the officers, petty officers, and crew of that tender, given under our hands the 10th of August, 1791. Chatham, J.T. Townshend, A. Gardner, to George Vancouver, Esquire, commander of His Majesty's Sloop the Discovery, by command of their lordships, P.H. Stevens. Amidst other objects demanding my attention, 
while engaged in carrying these orders into execution. No opportunity was neglected to remove, as far as I was capable, all such errors as had crept into the science of navigation and to establish in their place such facts as would tend to facilitate the grand object of finding the longitude at sea, which now seems to be brought nearly to a certainty by pursuing the lunar method assisted by a good chronometer. On this, as well as some other subjects, it is highly probable that great prolixity and repetition will be found in the following pages. It will, however, readily appear to the candid perusers of this voyage that, as the primary design of the undertaking was to obtain useful knowledge, it became an indispensable duty on my part to use my utmost exertions and abilities in doing justice to the original intention by detailing the information that arose in the execution of it in a way calculated to instruct, even though it should fail to entertain. And when the writer alleges that from the age of 13, his whole life, to the commencement of this expedition, 15 months only accepted, has been devoted to constant employment in His Majesty's naval service. He feels, and with all possible humility, that he has some claims to the indulgence of a generous public, who, under such circumstances, will not expect to find elegance of diction, purity of style, or unexceptionable grammatical accuracy, but will be satisfied with a plain, unvarnished relation given with a rigid attention to the truth of such transactions and circumstances as appeared to be worthy of being recorded by a naval officer whose greatest pride is to deserve the appellation of being zealous in the service of his king and country. Advertisement from the editor. As a commendable delay has necessarily taken place in the publication of this work in consequence of the decease of the late Captain Vancouver it becomes of absolute necessity to give an accurate account of the state of the work at the period when his last fatal indisposition rendered him incapable of attending more to business. Lest the melancholy event which has retarded its completion should tend to affect its authenticity in the public opinion. The five first volumes, excepting the introduction, and as far as page 43 of the sixth and last volume, were printed, and Captain Vancouver had finished a laborious examination of the impression and had compared it with the engraved charts and headlands of his discoveries from the commencement of his survey in the year 1791 to the conclusion of it at the port of Valparaiso on his return to England in the year 1795. He had also prepared the introduction and a further part of the journal as far as page 408 of the last volume. The whole, therefore, of the important part of the work, which comprehends his geographical discoveries and improvements, is now presented to the public, exactly as it would have been had Captain Vancouver been still living. The notes which he had made on his journey from the port of Valparaiso to his arrival at St. Jago de Chile, the capital of that kingdom, were unfortunately lost, and I am indebted to Captain Puget for having assisted me with his observations on that occasion. Ever since Captain Vancouver's last return to England, his health had been in a very debilitated state, and his constitution was evidently so much impaired by the arduous services in which, from his earliest youth, he had been constantly engaged, that his friends dared to indulge but little hope that he would continue many years among them. Note. The late Captain Vancouver was appointed to the resolution by Captain Cook in the autumn of the year 1771. And on his return from that voyage round the world, he undertook to assist in the outfit and equipment of the discovery, destined to accompany Captain Cook on his last voyage to the North Pole, which was concluded in October, 1780. On the 9th of December following, he was made a lieutenant into the Martin Sloop. In this vessel, he continued until he was removed into the Fame, one of the Lord Rodney's fleet in the West Indies where he remained until the middle of the year 1783. In the year 1784, he was appointed to and sailed in the Europa to Jamaica, on which station he continued until her return to England in September 1789. On the 1st of January 1790, he was appointed to the discovery, but soon afterwards was removed to the Courjure. Here he remained until December 1790, when he was made master and commander 
and appointed to the discovery. In August 1794, he was, without solicitation, promoted to the rank of post captain and was paid off on the conclusion of his last voyage in November 1795. After this period, he was constantly employed until within a few weeks of his decease in May 1798 in preparing the following journal for publication. End of note. Notwithstanding that it pleased the divine providence to spare his life until he had been able to revive and complete the account of the geographical part of his late voyage of discovery, a circumstance which must ever be regarded as most fortunate by all the friends of science, and especially by those professional persons who may hereafter be likely to follow him through the intricate labyrinth which he had so minutely explored, yet it will ever be a consideration of much regret that he did not survive to perfect the narrative of his labours. He had made many curious observations on the natural history of the several countries he had visited and on the manners, customs, laws and religion of the various people with whom he had met or amongst whom he had occasionally resided, but had been induced to postpone these miscellaneous matters lest the regular diary of the voyage should be interrupted by the introduction of such desultory observations these he had intended to present in the form of a supplementary or concluding chapter, but was prevented by the unfortunate event of his illness. Most of the papers which contain these interesting particulars are too concise and too unconnected for me to attempt any arrangement of them, or to submit them to the reader without hazarding Captain Vancouver's judgment as an observer or his reputation as a narrator, rigidly devoted to the truth. But as some of the notes which he made upon the spot are of too valuable a nature to be entirely lost, I shall venture to subjoin them to the history of the voyage as nearly as possible in his own words, without attempting any such arrangement of them as might tend to diminish their authenticity or bring into doubt that scrupulous veracity from which Captain Vancouver never departed. The whole narrative of the voyage of discovery, having been brought to its conclusion at Valparaiso by Captain Vancouver himself, there only remains for me to add that in preparing for the press the small remainder of his journal, comprehending the passage round Cape Horn to St. Helena and from thence to England, I have strictly adhered to the rough documents before me. But as no new incidents occurred in this part of the voyage, and as the insertion of logbook minutes over a space which is now so frequently traversed cannot either be useful or entertaining i have endeavored to compress this portion of the journal into as few pages as possible in performing this painful task i have had severe and ample cause to lament the melancholy office to which i have been compelled by the death of him whose early departure from this life has deprived his majesty of an active and able officer truth and science of a steady supporter, society of an uniformly valuable member, and in addition to the feelings of many who live to regret the loss of a sincere friend, I have to deplore that of a most affectionate brother. John Vancouver, 